Hi everyone, I'm very excited to be here in Aarhus. It's my uh, second time presenting here and uh, last year when I was here I talked about Hadoop and the Hadoop ecosystem and it spun up a lot of interesting questions so I guess I was invited back to address some of them maybe. Um, how many of you know Hadoop? Okay, how many of you have heard about big data? That's a big difference already from last year and the year before. Um, so I guess you're here, but why are you here? I'm, I'm Ivan Dresen, as Dean said. I work for a company called Cloudera. Uh, it's most well known for its distribution of Hadoop, but I'm not here to talk about our product line. I'm here to talk about big data and the landscape. Um, so why are you here? Well, if you, if you feel something like this cat, a little bit overwhelmed and confused by big data, you know, what it is, where, the, where all these technology belongs, where it comes from, uh, you're in the right place. This is a talk about uh, a kind of a historical perspective, a 10,000 feet view of the landscape, uh, what the drivers are to rethink data, uh, where Hadoop comes from, the industry trends, who are the vendors, what pocket of big data uh, do they land in, and when to use which tool. Those are the most common questions I get, so I, I, I chose to focus the first part on that. Second part will be more focused on bringing it down back to Earth again. A very concrete, small example of big data. Uh, trying to highlight the actual values beyond just large data size processing at, at scale. Uh, really highlighting that there are other aspects of big data as a concept as well. After that, a quick Q&A and a break, after which Dean Wampler will take the third part of this journey, actually starting to digging under the surface of the Earth uh, into a deep dive around Spark and also why SQL has this new uh, fuss and, and uh, interest around it. So let's get started with uh, a perspective. So what are the drivers in the big data space? Well, um, I'm sure you've heard about it and are somewhat familiar, but just to set the same foundation for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna walk you through the four perspectives as I see has led to the situation we're in today where we need to start rethink data management, data processing and data storage. So first of all, we have moved to where, where we do most of our business online. All the transactions, all the purchases that we do has increased a lot over the last decade, right? And with all these new businesses, new services, there's a whole new set of data types that are served and managed and processed and all, all new sets of technology around serving these data to the consumers, us. So that causes a lot of different types of data. The second driver is what we've seen escalating. There are no uh, longer just mobile devices generating logs about you know, how the cell phone itself is doing or how your laptop is doing, etc. There's a whole new set of innovation in the device space. It's your car, your GPS, uh, your, your clothes, your glasses, your watches, the things in your homes, starting com to communicate, sending back important information to the vendors, to the providers. And it, again, it's not only about health of the device, it's also about, okay, when do you use it? How often do you use it? Where are you when you use it? Are you nearby something else connected in my product stack? Who are you interacting with? What profiles are you interacting with when you use my product? All that information, that context around the customer is also generated by the devices today. The internet of things. It's a it's an enormous set of data that we are looking at coming towards us if we want to understand our users more. And that has exploded in innovation in the device world. Now, third driver is the 
not only business that we do online, it's also our social lives. We interact with our friends, we connect and, and talk and plan our careers, uh, we get entertained, we plan our vacation, you know, all the talk about where you go, what you do, it leaves a trace about the customer type you are, what you like to do, what you prefer, that movie you watched last Friday that you tweeted about, suddenly we know something about you. We can profile you, especially if we don't look at the individual, but we, we aggregate tons of data about individuals to a profile of a market segment. So people who don't like this movie also drives trucks. People who do like this movie like to drive a minivan or something like that. Okay, can we correlate some marketing program where we present, you know, uh, near the routes, the routes that minivan drivers often take, you know, maybe we should market those kind of movies on those kind of routes. It, it's more contextual about who you are, what you like, and you leave traces everywhere. Whenever you leave, uh, you know, a note on Facebook or Twitter or in some forum, we know something more about you. And we're not even aware all the time, all the information we share. And that's a big gold mine for enterprises out there. What if we can find more information about our consumer markets to fine tune our marketing, to reach our customers in less intrusive ways, if you start complaining about things, or, or you know, more timely manner, if you want to actually know about a special offer while driving on the way to, uh, to work and you just need to pick up something on the way and suddenly, you know, convenience, there's something there on sale, convenience, and leading more business to your services. All that trace around you on the web is generating a lot of information that isn't really structured. It's not like a timestamp and a value, right? It's actually some context that needs to be analyzed. What you actually think, some sentiment to it. The fourth driver is the technology itself. Since all these enterprises want to extract information from all these sets of massively generated data and variety of data in the number of data types we need to serve, technology innovation has been driven around collecting data at speed. How do we scale collecting all these data information types and, and sources and how do we also process it in a timely manner and serve information? How do we extract, analyze the data, extract information out of it? Has spun off a trend in data processing technology itself. How do we store this? And that has put pressure on traditional systems. Traditional systems are very well optimized for what we built them for. They've been dominating the market for many decades, and rightfully so. They have served us a good need, right? Uh, when you know the questions, when you know, like, okay, what products sold this year? You know you need to store some information about products, about transactions, and then you do a BI report and you're done, and you know something where to invest your money, right? But if you also want to correlate it with new data, like, but what does my customer say about that product? And how frequently do they use it? And in what regional areas? Suddenly you might actually have to collect other data sets. And that becomes a challenge for your traditional systems because new data types and large data sets to be correlated is a challenge. It's not easy to scale. Uh, when, when your data is 10x or, or you know, exponentially larger, or when you have to handle new data types that your original structure, which is stored with the data in the database, isn't modeled to handle that new type of data coming in. And remodeling data is also a costly business for these enterprises who want to extract new information from that gold mine. And interestingly enough, um, I mean, it's a round number, 10 to 20% of our data is structured, really structured. The other data out there being generated today, think about the devices, think about the social lives, it's unstructured or semi-structured. It's not really modeled into a predetermined world where you can model it into a specific structure and then stick to that business question forever after. You can't change your mind. You've locked into one model, 
and will experience a lot of cost if you have to move forward with new business needs, new data types, and unstructured or semi-structured data. Okay, so this is a wise word from one of my early managers in my career. Um, a smart engineer comes up with a great solution. A wise engineer knows to Google it first. Uh, so where does Hadoop come from? Well, it doesn't come just from random stance. Um, it actually, what the industry did was to look at, okay, we see these challenges coming. Let's look at a company that's already solved data scale and how we can do it and processing data and handling all these unstructured information or semi-structured data coming our way. And a company who had already done that was Google. And they had, for the last 10 years, published papers, ideas, that they've implemented somehow in-house on how to store, process, and access data at scale and handling multi-types, right? The first paper came out in 2003. This is a timeline of their paper publishing. Um, it was about Google file system, a distributed, uh, fail-safe, self-healing data storage system distributed across regular hardware as equally sized chunks that are replicated. So if one, you know, disks go down, the data exists elsewhere and you can continue without interruption, right? A year later, MapReduce paper came out and that was uh, kind of a new way of thinking about how to process data. It was distributed, it was a simple distributed API for read and write uh, around key value pairs. And it was mapped onto this distributed file system so you could actually process data at scale since each data size, data block, was equally sized, you can process it in parallel, and the processing of equally sized data would take the same time. So you can basically linearly scale out the processing of data. Two years later, they published the Big Table paper. That actually brought some interesting aspects to this stack uh, by bringing table-like semantics. You can actually access data as if it was a table. So a key value column-oriented um, data store where you can get random access to data, sparsely populated data. Then it took some years, and then a new little series of, of papers came out around more real-time oriented access. We have uh, Dremel and Tenzing that brought SQL, real SQL interfaces to the very same data store and the percolator that brought real-time indexing so you can search over your data as well. And then more recently, the Spanner project, which is really interesting. So why am I talking about Google? Aren't you here to learn about you know, Hadoop and, and big data technology? Well, this is ideas. Someone with this need went and looked at these ideas and then decided to make it accessible for, for everybody. Since the, the, the data, big data problem is hitting everybody, it's written on the wall, it's coming our way, why don't we make it open source? And if you map in the Hadoop timeline with uh, Apache licensed projects, uh, popping up. It's very well timed. I thought this was interesting, so I'm sharing it with you. It's very well timed with the Hadoop ecosystem. Hadoop came out um, 2000, end of 2005, 2006, and uh, it's basically a distributed file system with MapReduce processing on it. And then you have Agebase and, and uh, Impala and Solar Cloud moved last year. Uh, the real-time access frameworks. So you see, it's a very good mapping and it's very interesting where it comes from. So if we use the same Hadoop timeline and, and start looking at the vendors in this space, the ecosystem, the landscape, um, you see, I think you can see um, that it started around maybe 2007, 2008 and it has escalated. 
You see more and more vendors jumping into the pot, trying to get a piece of this. And it's interesting, because when big vendor names, as you see up there, who's joined this infrastructure technology evolution and change, when you see them jump on board on something, you know, at least in my mind, I think you know that it's real. It's, it's not just a, a temporary trend that will go away. When they engage, they actually validate that this is a disruptive technology and they are planning to do something about it. And just to explain the dotted lines here, um, you see, uh, so Green Plum was acquired by EMC and then through a joint partnership with VMware, uh, they turned into Pivotal, which is an independent subsidiary. Uh, you have Oracle. They decided to join the race by adopting Cloudera's distribution and embed it in their solution. And then you have Microsoft, who joined in a technical partnership to uh, move Hadoop to Azure. And then you have Intel, who first started with their own distribution, but uh, earlier this year decided to join Cloudera in a technical partnership and merge the distribution technologies and, and ideas together. So maybe it's too early to say, but some solutions have started to consolidate. But um, we're definitely in, in that exciting phase of a disruptive technology, and the market has embraced it. It's not just an a interesting idea anymore. It's actually real. And, and as you can see, if you take a wider view of the vendors in this place, it's not only Hadoop vendors, right? If you take a step back and look at the wider market of big data technology uh, providers, a lot of them base it on open source technology. It's very important that the core is open source, so you don't miss out on any new innovation in such a rapid, disruptive market and technology space but then you build value add on top of it. You have the traditional databases. I, I, I chose to keep them here um, because they're still very important in our data centers to handle uh, a well-optimized ecosystem around the more transactional workloads. Uh, but then you see other vendors in the more cloud space where they provide this uh, scalable data processing as a service. And cloud has actually taken off a little bit more uh, recent years in the data processing space as more and more enterprises have figured out what use cases to serve in the cloud and what to keep on-prem. And we see hybrid uh, models growing in the enterprise space where I, I work with many of the customers there. And then we have, and these two buckets are, of course, overlapping. They're, there are no straight lines. It's kind of fuzzy. We see analytics vendors in the operational space, and we see operational vendors in the analytics space. So don't, don't take this as the truth. It's, it's one view of it to simplify the world. And uh, you see more operational specialized singletons uh, in, the, in one bucket there, while the distributed multi-purpose multi uh, frameworks are are in the analytics bucket there. And on top of this, we see a rapid movement of applications. What do I mean with that? Well, traditional data applications such as, um, I don't know, SaaS, uh, MicroStrategy, Tableau, Oracle, Microsoft, are moving applications not only to process data and, and give application access to data in databases, but also on top of these other alternative backends today. They're already moved to integrate the two and allow end users the same familiar experience to handle their data, but with the benefits of these newer, um, innovative data processing systems. And then, you see a whole bunch of new companies popping up. One example is Hexadata, which will actually give a talk tomorrow, I think, if the schedule hasn't changed. Uh, so you can go and learn how to do predictive analytics using their framework on top of some of these backends. 
And then you see other types of new vendors, such as Zoom Data, for instance, which is a very interesting new way of visualizing data, where you can fast forward and fast backward and zoom into your different data use cases and sets and see it visualized in many, many different ways, just uh, you know, beyond bar charts and, and regular timelines, right? And this is the space where I find really interesting. This is the space that will evolve next. What kind of applications can be built next to combine the values of these new backends that can handle the challenges of big data? What is the next application out there? And we see a lot of startups. I, I live in Silicon Valley. And just by osmosis, you get connected with a lot of startups and venture capitalists. And where they are looking right now is in this layer. They've already moved past the infrastructure layer. There's enough movement and vendors. Well, there's never enough. But the interest has moved one step above. That's where the venture capital of funds are, are looking to find the next app. What's the new way we need to process and access data on top of these new established, now established backends? That's where things are happening. And of course, spoiler, spoiler alert, um, you know, I thought I was really smart coming up with my own bucketing around vendors and trying to give some clarity of the landscape. And then I googled it, and I found this much better chart. <laughs> so Wise Engineer might have found this. Um, and this is thanks to Matt Turk and, and Shivan Zillis. Um, I found it online. It's much more granular sorting of the vendors in the space. Some might actually have disappeared. It's a very changing space, so apologies for that. Uh, but I think it's kind of giving a better view of how much activity there is in this space today. It's not new anymore. It's actually flourishing, right? And I'm leaving it here for your records. It's kind of an eye chart, so don't, don't bother reading it now. And then as a last point to this, um, it's not only me standing here saying this. It's actually you know, where many industry uh, decision makers, CIOs go, is to look at these analyst reports and understand, you know, what, what does everybody else do? <laughs> and analysts talk with everybody else, right? So what happened this year, and I think this is a very interesting milestone, is that three Hadoop or, um, you know, new data management vendors popped up in the traditional chart over uh, data management and, and data enterprise uh, warehouse uh, technology. This is the Gartner report uh, to the right, containing three of those vendors. It's also kind of an eye chart. I didn't mean to point and market three particular vendors. The point is, they are there this year. They weren't last year. So it's kind of a validation point. All right. We've talked about the technology, where it comes from, where it is, uh, how the vendor space is happening and are here to stay. Um, but it is interesting to reflect on the architectural effects of this big data movement as well. And where companies are looking to go is they have started talking. I mean, I sit in discussions with, you know, the global uh, 500, Fortune 500 companies and talk with their strategy teams, their IT planning for the next two to five years. And I, I'm, I'm fascinated by their conversations and their insights. But one thing that's common across verticals is that they've started talking about information driven on every level in the company. What does this mean? Well, every role, every organization, every team needs access to data. And to be truly flexible to new needs in the market, you need to make sure that every deci decision is based on data, so you make the right decision. But 
that all the data that everybody in your organization has access to is the same. Then you can be truly independent of each other, right? So if, if organization A has the same data as organization B, you can make the same conclusions if you are data-driven. So to become data-driven, information-driven, it's kind of challenging in the enterprise architecture deployments today. This is what, I, what we see when we go in there. It's a lot of different backends where data lives in multiple copies or you're moving data around and transform it on the way. It's very complex. And it's no judgment. It's what's happened over the years as companies grow, new use cases come in. Instead of remodeling some old system that nobody wants to touch because the guy who wrote it has already left or the gal who wrote it has moved on in the organization, you know, you add a new system to serve new use cases or new business questions needed to be asked. You add new systems that are specialized for that kind of use case, right? And over time, through acquisition or other growth factors, your data center has come to look like this, where you have to serve a multitude of audiences of this very heterogeneous environment. How do you do that cost efficiently, right? How do you do that in a speedy, timely manner? Also, when your data volumes coming in might be growing forward, right? Well, the concept, the category, it's an architecture, it's a it's like an enterprise data warehouse or a data mart. That kind of category that has emerged is called the enterprise data hub. It's a place where all your data can land, so everybody has access to the same truth. And then you serve it either natively from that data hub to a variety of audiences using different tools that can operate integrated with the hub. Or you use the hub to pre-process it and serve the results through your optimized systems. And then, of course, not all use cases can move immediately over to an enterprise data hub. You can use these systems that are optimized for transactional workloads still for that, but you can open up space on them, enabling more volume to actually be more served from the data hub. So this is a new category that has come from the same drivers, trends, and technology needs uh, that we've just discussed. And another way of looking at it is, of course, uh, the real architecture of the Enterprise Data Hub is actually a file system or a way to access that data as a kind of database-like system. You have a shared resource management. You have a shared security model. You have governance and data ingest and management. You have production visibility. You have all that. Those requirements have not gone away. They are still needed, just like for other data management systems. But what's different is that different frameworks interoperate directly with this shared data store, right? Bring workloads natively. And Instead of moving data around to different audiences, you can just choose a framework to serve a particular audience. So, now we're starting the landing phase here. We're coming back to Earth. So buckle up your seat belts because this is the last phase of the 10,000 feet view. I get the question of what, what should I use? I mean, Hadoop is a wide ecosystem of weirdly named projects, and I, I don't know what to do with which. Well, this is my very simple reference guide of what to use for what. So if you have the same data store, you can choose from a variety of frameworks to process and serve your data. If you have real-time query needs, if you want to do BI reports, the ones you already do, or new ones as new needs come in, over combined data sets or larger data sets, then a real-time query engine is what you need. And one example is Impala, right? If you 
rather have some long running ETL workload where you want to start it and it should run overnight. It should be very, very fail safe, fail over. All intermediate data sets should be written to disk and persisted, etc. You need a more you know, batch oriented workload and Pig and Hive are excellent tools for that. But Pig and Hive are not really good when you want interactive, quick, speed of thought, analytical queries, because then you have to sit and wait for hours for that, you know, vast framework uh, MapReduce to spin up and process data and, you know, aggregate it. MapReduce is the foundation of Hive and Pig. If you have another type of query use case where it's more about fuzzy matching or random uh, terms and and your SQL queries for it starts looking like a mess with uh, you know 25 to 100 different like uh, function calls then you might want to consider to use a search engine instead of use an indexing engine to process your data and serve it so that you can do phonetic search or dictionary search or shape based search there's a variety of powerful tools uh, just within a search engine that might be tricky to accomplish in a traditional SQL query engine. If you want to serve a web service in real time and do some quick analytics over um, you know, sparsely populated data, let's say you have a website and while a session is going on, you want to serve ads or suggestions of what else to look at while the customer is still walking through your website, you can um, do analytics over those web click streams and profile other users that have looked at the same items using a data store like HBase. It can serve in real time suggestions and you can, we have many, many uh, use cases where recommendation engines or ad engines are built on top of HBase, right? And then, I'm not going to go in deeply to Spark, since we're going to have a deep dive on it next session. Uh, but if you want to implement some kind of analytics, be it graph uh, strength or some machine learning or some other kind of pattern extraction, and the data set is fairly neat, it can actually fit into memory uh, into the RAM of those machines you can access for this use case, then Spark is a very, very efficient real-time analytics framework. And if you have real-time streaming data, there's a Spark streaming that is evolving to handle those kind of event processing uh, workloads as well. But if you have that, again, ETL, long-term running, you want to persist every step, the data set might be, you know, one petabyte, you want to do some analytics over that. Maybe a framework like MapReduce would be better in that case. So this is the quick reference guide, you know, just to give an idea what the tools are there for. And again, think about that visual of the Enterprise Data Hub, where all these workloads can actually work against the same data store and fully integrated with each other. So we're at the last part, and this is a simple example. We're going to walk through big data values um, exemplified through a data corporation that I made up. Um, it's a product provider, and it's medium-sized. It has most revenue coming in online. And there is a lot of customer transactions, and they store it in a traditional relational database. And they kind of think like, yeah, business as usual. Um, we don't really have any challenges other than the market might get more, uh, more and more crowded. How, we, how do we drive new traffic to our uh, products and our website? And it sounds like pretty much any company, right? And they, head of IT at this company says this, I only have like 100 gigabytes. I don't have a big data problem. I hear this a lot. And the examples I'm doing is 
yeah, of course, if you have big data, if you have large sizes of data, the, the platform and the technologies and the architectures I've been talking about can address that. But I'm going to take a different spin and highlight some other aspects of big data through my examples. So pretend you work for this head of IT and you're like, OK, I'm pretty smart or wise, your, your preference. Uh, and you have a 10-node CDH cluster running. CDH is Cardia's distribution of Hadoop in Amazon, just for the fun of it. The first step you would do is to try something you already know, just to familiarize yourself with a new environment and new platform and prove that you can do what your managers or this head of IT actually expects you to do. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do the same thing same product reports, calculating the top most sold products, but in Hadoop. So the approach we would take would be load the pro product sales data into Hadoop. Uh, and we're going to use Scoop for that, because Scoop is a ni nice tool for structured data transport. And we're going to convert it to Avro, just for the fun of it, and to prepare it for other workloads that might be using the same data forward. You don't know. But Avro is an optimized file format that uh, takes away the complexity of having to serialize and deserialize data uh, for MapReduce, for example. So we're just going to do that to spice up our example. And then we're going to use Hive to create tables to serve the questions at hand. The tables might be different than the tables you have, but you know, in this first use case, they're probably much the same. And then we're going to use Impala to query, because we don't want to sit at our computer and wait forever. So same use case, different platform. And here are some code examples, and it's just examples. Uh, the first one is to show that Scoop is a command line interface. You uh, launch Scoop, and you put some parameters in there that transports your tables to HDFS. And then there are two commands exemplifying how to look at your tables and also how to look at the data that serves a particular table. In our case, a bunch of Avro files, right? So this is how hard it is to get data into Hadoop using Scoop. Step two, create tables. Uh, we launch the Hive command line shell if we want. And we create some tables. And I can't show all the tables you need for this example. That would take too much time in my slides. But it's an example to showcase that you can use the same SQL language you're familiar with to create a table. But it happens to be a Hive command shell. Once you have your tables that you want to do uh, the query over, and note here, the tables live separate from your data. Your data is ingested. Tables is just a structure for that particular use case you're looking at at that particular time. The structure separate from data makes it very flexible, and we'll see that in the next example. So we can use Hue, which is a UI, part of the distro. And you type your query in there on your tables in the Hive query, uh, sorry, in the Impala query application, because we didn't want to sit there forever. And you get your results set back. And what we see is like, OK, it seems to be sports goods that are the top 10 most selling products. And it's all good, and we're done. So that wasn't hard. The point here, you can do the same thing, but in this new platform, and it's not hard. And then keep in mind, you can do it over larger sets of data as well. The second step is a new angle of big data that I hope to share some light over. What if we have the same business question? What product should we invest in? But use a different data set to answer that question. Really getting big data value from correlating data sets. That's another angle of big data. So what we do is lo load some web log data. We want to see what people look at while they're on our website. And you know, see if it correlates with what we actually sell. So we're going to use um, Flume 
a real-time ingest framework that subscribes to events and posts to Hadoop uh, to ingest these web click streams in, in, uh, in real time. And then we're going to use Hive to create tables over that semi-structured data. Hive is the same tool, though. We just saw how it was used. And then we're going to use Hue and Impala to query that, same way we did. Different kind of data set, though, right? So Flume, it's a PubSub ingestion framework. It is very flexible. You can um, deploy it as a hierarchy where you do many transformations on the way, if you will. You want to route certain parts of the data somewhere while other parts somewhere else. Um, it basically has a source that you configure to consume uh, the events, be it syslog, tweets, whatever real-time generated event kind of data that, that you have. In our case, the web click streams. And then you do some optional logic. If you want to cleanse it or whatever, you don't have to. It's optional. And then you publish it either to Hadoop, in our case we will, or somewhere else. And here is, I'm going to wait with the Flume configuration because I'm going to do it again in example three. Um, but imagine we have the data coming in, streaming through Flume. We do some tables through Hive again, same way. And then we go to Hue to query that data. And ta-da, what do we find? Well, the top 10 most viewed products has a diff if you correlate it with the top 10 most sold products. And suddenly we know something, and we can ask a new question, why? And we can go and start investigating this. Well, maybe we price the product wrong, so people actually turn away from our website for that product that is viewed but not bought. It's a, it's a kid's football, okay? Maybe, maybe we can create a new marketing program for families. Maybe it's kids viewing the product and they don't really have any purchasing power, but we can talk to the parents and maybe that can help, if, especially if we find that we can bundle it with products that parents look, look at at the same time. There's, there's interesting information and insight to make, make a better business decision by correlating two different data sets, structured and semi-structured, in the same platform. And it's not that difficult, right? So business question number two. This is the third and last example before we wrap up. So why is sales suddenly dropping? Well, that's a new business question. Suddenly something happens with the sales data coming in. And we're going to use the same data set as we just set up with Flume, the real-time web clickstream, to figure out if something is going on with our uh, online store. So same data for new business question. That's another big data value because you don't have to move the data to different infrastructure to serve it. The data is already there. You can just use a different framework, process it, and serve it. That's the key. So we're going to use the same data. We're going to use an indexing engine, Solar Cloud to index it, but we're going to do that in real time. So we're going to reconfigure our Flume engine to post events to Solar. And then we're going to use Hue again, but the search application Hue to free text search our web click stream data. So first we create an empty Solar index configuration. And then we introspect the Solar scheme and change it to the fields we're actually interested searching over at that particular time. For that use case, you can always change your mind. That's the idea, right? And then we upload our configuration to Zookeeper, who keeps track of the truth. In case one of the solar nodes goes down, it's fail safe, right? So Zookeeper keeps the truth. No risk of split brain in a search cluster on Hadoop. And then we tell solar to start serving up uh, a collection and start accepting data to index it for it. And then we're going to configure the data using Flume again to post to Solar the incoming events so Solar can accept them and index them as they arrive. And in our Flume sync, 
we use a framework called Morphlines, which is a mini ETL uh, pre-built Java library that looks and smells like Unix pipelines. So you can process your data as if it was a line-by-line -line, uh, command line uh, transformations. And then uh, we publish it to Solar Cloud. And you can also do custom morph lines. You can, instead of using these prepared Grok and whatever pre-built uh, transformations for your data, uh, needs. You can also implement your own morph lines and use them. That's what we're going to do. Here's an example. And then the lower part here is the actual Flume configuration part, where you point to what morph lines you use to transform your data, extract the fields and map them into the solar schema, and also what solar cluster on Hadoop you're going to publish them to. And ta-da! Now you can go to the Hue search application and drill down into your web clickstream data and analyze. Maybe it was a DDoS attack going on. So you can address that, and suddenly your sales goes back up. Another tool, another use case, but same data without moving it around. And if you want to try these examples on your own, we are going to launch uh, the 6th of October free trial clusters that you can play with. But that's a side note. Um, so I leave that behind. The key takeaways from today is that information-driven dri businesses is what organizations are striving for. And it's essential if you're going to survive in a more competitive market. Uh, Hadoop is a dis disruptive technology. And the drivers in the market has opened up for this technology. And more and more vendors has popped up but the big vendors are there too, and it's established, it's validated. It's not going to go away yet. And uh, use the right load for the right workload, <laughs> right tool for the right workload. And also remember that big data is not only about the data size, it's about correlating various kinds of data sets or serving multiple use cases of the same data without having to move it around. And I hope that you now feel like this kitten and that you actually learned something. And if you did, please vote. Please vote anyway. Um, and let me know what you think. Any questions? I don't even see you guys. No questions. You must be brilliant. All right. After the break, Dean Wampler will be back and deep dive into Spark and the new hype around a new era of SQL. Thank you. My name is Dean Wampler. I get to introduce myself. Um, if you attended the last session, Eva Andreessen gave sort of a a broad overview of the big data landscape and talked about a few scenarios for ingesting data and doing analysis on it. In this session, I'm going to dive into two specific areas that are kind of uh, very hot right now. The first is a general purpose compute engine called Spark that I'm very excited about uh, for reasons I hope you'll see by the you know, 40, 20 minutes from now, whatever. And then I want to talk about how SQL is making a big comeback in the big data space. Uh, not that NoSQL has been invalidated in any sense, but that as these things go, we tend to swing in pendulums. You know, we swung hard over to the NoSQL side, got to the point of even dismissing SQL, and now we're coming back. And in a way, those comments will be sort of complementary to what Mark uh, Madsen was talking about earlier today if you visited his talk. And I think it, it would be worth uh, looking at that online if you missed his talk and you're interested in you know, what's the role of SQL, SQL, uh, in the uh, data world today. My name is uh, Dean Wampler, as I said. I work for TypeSafe. TypeSafe is not a big data company per se, even though that's what I've been doing the last few years, but we're starting to you know, grow into that area. We mostly developed a Scala language and tools on top of it. Um, you can, I haven't posted this talk yet on my Polyglot programming site, but I have some other uh, talks there if you're interested. And of course, this talk will be on the conference website. Uh, all these three books are reasonably priced outside. Um, 
Although I actually don't recommend you buy the second one, the big one, because it, this is actually the second edition that's coming out next month, and they have the first edition, so I don't want anybody to be disappointed. Um, anyway. So it's, two, it's 2014. I always use pretty pictures of my hiking trips, because if you get bored with the material, at least you'll have something to do. Um, and this is Colorado in the western United States. Anyway, uh, at this point, Hadoop has been really successful. Uh, I'm sure, sure all of you have heard of Hadoop by now. I won't even ask because it's kind of a given. Um, but it, like everything, it's a first-generation technology. It solved a lot of really good problems. And really, it's pieces of first-generation technologies. And we're getting to the point where we're starting to see second-generation technologies emerge. And that's really kind of the theme of this, this talk. It, it's not perfect. Um, there have been some warts that have uh, become increasingly important to fix, and maybe the most important one was the compute engine called MapReduce. And I'll explain what MapReduce is in a second, but we kind of realized that we needed to fix it or, or replace it, and that's kind of what's happened here. The problem with MapReduce, well, first let's talk about briefly what it is. So it's really the two things stuck together, mapping over data and reducing it. And what that basically means, it'll be a little clear as we walk through some examples, but in parallel, I might read a bunch of data that's kind of off the screen on the left in these so-called map processes, and that would do initial maybe filtering, you know, transformation, whatever. It spits out key value pairs on the back end. Those keys, are, you know, whatever those key value pairs are depends on the algorithm you're implementing. And then there's a process where the keys are sorted locally on each process, those map tasks or JVM processes. And then they're shuffled over the cluster that's all done for you so that, you know, if you're doing like word count, that is you want to count the occurrences of all words and documents, then all the words, all the occurrences of Hadoop as a key might show up in that first reducer task, and then you'll just add up all the ones you get, that sort of thing. Well, it'll be more clear as we go, but just so you know where the word map reduce comes from so you can impress your friends at the uh, reception after the talk. Uh, so there's a bunch of problems with it, though. I mean, even though it's been great, it was invented at Google, so it has to be good. Uh, and it served us well for all these years, actually 10 years now, really, uh, problems have come up. It's kind of a limited programming model, actually. If all you have is map and reduce, you kind of have to hammer your algorithm into it, and some things just don't work so well. Like, it turns out iterative algorithms, like training a machine learning model, is really hard to do in this model, at least to do efficiently. And it turns out the Hadoop Java API is kind of a nightmare to work with. I'm, I have high aesthetic opinions about what software should look like. And when I saw the Hadoop API, I was really rather offended by it and uh, really wanted something better. Fortunately, that's what we're getting. But just to give you an example, uh, just to kind of show the before and after, if you will, let's talk about another algorithm called inverted index. And this is actually the basis of search engines, at least in the simplest case, where what I want to do is I'm going to uh, like crawl the web, and I want to find, say, all the documents on the web, and here I have some made-up examples from Wikipedia. And what I'm going to do is build up a data set that these web crawlers are going to write for me you know, all the time. They're just running constantly, right? And it'll just be two columns. It'll be some ID for what this document is. In this case, I'm just using the name or the URL. And then just the contents of the document. Maybe I stripped out HTML tags. Maybe not. It doesn't really matter. That's, so, that's sort of my index of documents to words. I want to invert it to have words to documents. So some sort of magic is going to happen in the middle, and we'll look at the magic in a second, or miracle, I guess. And the output we want is what you would want if you were trying to like, implement a search engine, if you wanted to be the next Google, where you would want to tokenize those contents of documents into words and then find all the occurrences of, of a given word in all the documents. So, you know, for example, uh, in my made-up example, the word HBase appeared in two documents. Uh, you know, I, I used ellipses for the full paths because they're kind of long. And I might want to know how many times the word occurred in there because obviously a, a page that's devoted to HBase will talk about it a lot, and that's probably the document you want to see first if you were returning results to a user. So we need to do this miracle part in the middle. And just for completeness, here's the whole thing together. So this is what it looks like in the Hadoop API. And if you don't like looking at Java, it's a good time to avert your gaze, you know, you know bury your eyes or something. I'm not going to talk through all of this code. It goes on endlessly. Um, you'll, what you'll notice is that uh, I used yellow for functions. And if you just sort of pay attention a little bit, you notice that all the functions in this code 
don't really do a whole lot of work. Well, maybe main does because it does everything. But things like, you know, set a value, get a value. I mean, it's kind of boring, you know, low content, takes up a lot of space, doesn't deliver a lot of value. And in the sort of functional way of thinking about the world, we really want our functions to pack a lot of punch. Well, you know, when I do something like a map, I want it to do a major amount of work for me so that I write as little code as possible. So that's sort of where we're going with this. But anyway, the, you know, the first page here is just telling Hadoop uh, configuration stuff. Like, here's the name of the class for mapping and for reducing, and here's the types I'm going to input and output, and all kinds of stuff that it apparently can't figure out on its own. Finally, I run the job after configuring it, and I have a, you know, an exception clause for whatever purpose. I'm not really sure. Then I start my class that does mapping. Remember I said we do these map and reduce steps, and I have to implement this method map, and there's a whole bunch of stuff I pass to the argument. A lot of it is in a ceremony. It's infrastructure, like this thing that's called a reporter, and this output collector is where I'm going to write my key value pairs I talked about. The interesting bit is that key and val uh, thing that I'm showing here. You know, that's like, well, let's not even worry about what it is. Just think of it as the document right now, the document contents. But then I've got to write a lot of Java code to split this thing and, uh, you know, write these key value pairs I mentioned in the middle. And then it just keeps going. Now here's my reducer, and I've got a whole bunch of stuff on the screen, and, you're, you know, your eyes are bleeding. And, uh, you know, I'm just building up. Basically, all I'm really doing now is getting all those occurrences of the word HBase and the word Hadoop together and writing those little you know, t tuples of like document ID count, document ID count. So there's just a whole lot of hoo-ha here. And then it's done, mercifully. And the thing is, this is like a software engineering project. And it's not a, it, this is a simple algorithm. It's not the simplest I could write, but it's a very simple algorithm. And it, you know, it fits on the screen with six-point font, which even I can't read when I look at the screen. Um, but I have to go through all the usual software engineering stuff. It takes you know, a couple hours to write this, even if you know the API. If you don't, it's going to take a couple days. And it's a simple algorithm. And if it's not a simple algorithm, it just, the complexity just exponentially ramps up. So it's terrible. Um, and it also only lets me do batch mode analysis. So you know, that was great when Google invented MapReduce you know, back in the day. Um, you know, it was probably OK if they had these web crawlers building up that data set and maybe once a day. You know, they would calculate a new index for searching. But that sucks, right? Because as soon as you make an edit to your web page, you know, your great e-commerce site, whatever, you want the search results to reflect those changes, like, you know, immediately or within maybe, you know, a few minutes or an hour at least. So you'd really like this to be running constantly. You know, as events come in of changes, you'd really like to have your index reflect those as quickly as possible. And that's a, you know, trivial case. More realistic or serious cases are, you're like watching log data and all of a sudden a server is screaming, I'm on fire. You don't want to wait till you know, tonight to figure out that your server's on fire when you run this batch mode job. So we really want to do event streaming data too. And MapReduce is not at all designed for that. There's also a serious performance problem. Well, there's a lot of them really, but uh, the one that's the worst is... Now, the example I showed, I could write one MapReduce job, uh, you know, map tasks, reduce tasks, uh, and to implement it. But a lot of algorithms, you can't do it quite in that few steps. You kind of have to sequence some of these jobs together. Unfortunately, MapReduce doesn't know you're doing this. So I might have terabytes of intermediate data out of the, one of those steps, but I have to write it all to disk, you know, flush it out of memory, even if the next job that's going to start immediately is going to read it all back in. And it turns out that just fixing that, like smart caching of that intermediate data can easily give you a 100x performance gain in a lot of algorithms. So we need to fix that problem. And that's where Spark came in. So about a year ago now, maybe a little longer than that, the uh, major Hadoop vendors realized, you know, we really need to embrace something new that seems to be proven or at least have the potential to take over that fixes all these problems. And that turned out to be a Berkeley University project that had been kind of incubating for really since 2009 or so. It had already become an Apache project. And so they, they sort of wholesale decided this is the next generation. Now, I should say, if you really actually have big data, like if you're Twitter or you know, Facebook or whatever, Map, uh, Spark probably isn't quite ready for your massive data sets. But for most of us, the sort of intermediate data that we might be working with, it's probably perfectly fine. But you know, as always, you should 
be paranoid and test everything to make sure you can make this switch. But I hope you'll see within you know, the next few minutes why this is such a great thing, why it's going to be worth it when it's finally ready or maybe ready already for your needs. The first thing it does is it gives us a really elegant and concise programming model. We're going to shrink that code I showed you before down to basically 10 or so lines with maybe a little bit of setup and teardown that you, you have to have in most languages. And we're going to get rid of most of the ceremony so that we can focus on the problem. What else have we got? It is written in Scala. Uh, I mentioned I work for TypeSafe, so I might have a little bias here. But I hope you'll see that it's actually not bad Scala if you've ever been you know, if you dislike Scala, I, that's okay. You can use Python or Java, and actually the R language is coming. There, there's a team working on that if you're interested. But I'll show you Scala code, and I, you know, I'll explain just enough so you get the gist of what's going on. Obviously, we don't have enough time to teach Scala, but I hope you'll get the sense for how concise you can make statements that do exactly what you want to do and don't require a whole lot of stuff uh, wrapped around it. And they also, uh, Spark also leverages the power of functional programming, these so-called combinators. And basically, they're functions that don't have side effects. They take inputs. They do some sort of transformation. They output stuff. And it turns out you can just sequence those together like a pipeline. Like, we're basically going to build plumbing and then turn on the spigot and then run the data through it. And it's uh, really, in my opinion, this is the most effective reuse technique we've ever invented in software. Well, combinators were actually invented in math mathematics, but nevertheless, far better than objects, far better than almost anything else we've come up with. And you'll, I think, hope you'll see what I mean when we get to the example here in a minute. Another nice feature of Spark is that you're not limited to Map or, or rather Hadoop, even though that's probably the way most people are going to use it for the foreseeable future. Uh, you can actually run it on this new uh, clustering framework called Mesos that uh, Twitter has been working on. It's another Berkeley project. They hired the grad student. He didn't get his PhD as a result. Uh, but he did finish uh, Mesos, so that maybe that was better for all of us. You can run it in EC2 if you're uh, already working in Amazon. And there's even a little simple standalone mode where you can set up kind of a static cluster that's just you know, special purpose and doesn't require a lot of ceremony like disaster recovery and all that sort of thing. Like that's what you would do in development or maybe a research lab where you're prototyping algorithms or doing basic data analytics. The, the core abstraction of Spark, upon which everything else is based, which is why I picked these kind of rocks here, and it's kind of a foundation. Anyway, that's, that's what I was thinking. Um, it's called a resilient distributed data set. So what we're going to do, we're going to read in this data that we want to put in memory. And we're going to shard it over the cluster, so that's the distributed part, although it, you know, virtually it appears like it's one big collection. In the same way the file system, like HDFS, the Hadoop file system, looks like one uh, big file system, even though it's actually over a bunch of uh, servers. The resilient part is not so much that they actually like, make re redundant copies. If a node goes down, you've got data elsewhere. Uh, to save space, they actually adopted this model, is they keep track of where all the data came from. Like if you're in the midpoint of some you know, pipeline and you lose a node, they can actually go back and recreate that data on another node. Of course, it's going to take some time to do that. Uh, there's reasons why you may not want to always do that. But when you think about the fact that, yes, servers do crash, but it really isn't that often. You know, most of the time, this is going to work just fine. So, uh, you know, schematically, it looks something like this. I have this one RDD, but the, it's broken into partitions across different nodes in my cluster. OK, uh, this is Scala code coming up. So, you know, fair warning, you know, cover your eyes. If you don't like Scala, it, it'll go quickly. But uh, this is the inverted index in Scala. Actually, this implementation does a little bit more than the other one does, but it uses a lot less code anyway. So uh, like most JVM languages, we have to do some imports at the start. But in this case, we just import this thing called a Spark context. That's kind of like our driver. You know, that's, how, that's the entry point that we start with. Um, Scala has this notion of um, the singleton design patterns actually baked in the, in the language. So where I say object inverted index, just think class inverted index. And there's a singleton instance that I don't have to manage myself. And that's where we put things like the main routine. So like the previous example, we're just going to run all this in main. OK, the first thing I do is I create a Spark context. And then I use this text file method to uh, read the data from that path. And, and text file means it's going to assume that each line in the file is, is a single field record. And then we'll you know, parse it as we see fit from there. 
And then we're going to map over it. And notice there's a dot in front of the map and also in front of the flat map. I'm basically building up this chain of, of method invocations that are forming my pipeline. You know, I could assign intermediate variables if I wanted, but usually you just do it this way. And that thing in curly braces is a function, an anonymous function I pass to map. And it says for each line you know, coming out of the input file, I want you to first split it on the first tab you find. So this will assume it's the crawl data that we generated you know, separately as tab delimited. But of course, there would be tabs in the text. So I only want to split into two and just grab on the first tab. And then uh, Scala also has a nice syntax for creating a tuple. I don't have to declare a class that returns two things like you do in Java, which just annoys the hell out of me. I could just say, you know, parentheses, uh, first element of the array, second element of the array, and I have a little two-element tuple, and I can just sling it around. It, the, uh, the types are inferred here. There's very few types in this program, uh, and that's because Scala, even though it's a statically typed language, is inferring types. So actually, I think Spark and another big data uh, a uh, Scala API called Scalding do a pretty nice job hiding the complexities of Scala and letting you write stuff where all the, most of the types are inferred, except where you might want them. We'll see an example in a minute where we're going to use a class to specify a schema for the data that we want to work with. All right, so I mapped over it to do that uh, splitting into the what was the document path and then the, the contents of the document. Flat map is an extension of map where now I want to split the contents, which is called well, I'm calling it text here. I'm going to split on everything that isn't an alphanumeric character, so that'll be how I tokenize into words. Yes, it's a crude way to do it, but it, it's good enough for now. Uh, so what, it, what flat map does is instead of like a one-to-one -one thing, I'm actually going to generate like an array and an array and array for each input text. But then the flat part is where I'm just going to flatten it, so I just have this one long array of these two element tuples again that's going to be a word and that original path or document ID. So now I've got Word, document ID, Word, document ID, et cetera. And then the next few lines is really just, whoops, I went a little too fast there, is really kind of tuple hacking. I actually need to do a little rearranging to do group by effectively. And so all I need to do is like in this next map step is do a pattern match on the, that word and path and then just rearrange things a bit. Actually, what I'm doing here is I'm nesting that inside another tuple with a count of one that little nested word and path is now going to be a key that I use for like join, finding all the things that are the same. So I want to find all the words and paths that match together. And then they have this built-in thing called reduce by key where it's going to take that first, uh, you know, each of those word path pairs and then sum up the thing that's left, which is just the count of one. So that's how I get the total count of each of those word path pairs. And then I do some more rearranging of the tuples to get it back the way I want. I, you know, the output I want is, you know, here's the word, and then here's this list of paths and counts. And so that's what this last map statement does. And then finally, I do a group by, you know, our old friend from SQL. Uh, do a group by over effectively the word, and that's going to give me, um, you know, that long list of all of the documents and counts that were a given word occurred. And the last map statement is just rearranging the output. So there's not much going on. It looks complicated, but it, all it's really doing is just prettifying the output the way I want it. And then finally, notice that all these dot somethings, dot somethings, these heavyweight functions that are doing a hell of a lot of work for me. Pardon my French. Anyway, uh, now I'm going to save all this to uh, a text file. And I forgot to fix the argument to the text file. This was a co copy paste thing. It, you know, it's some path that I want to write to. And then we say stop when we're done when we've done this processing. So right now, we're still in batch mode land. Remember I said that we'd like to be able to do streaming? Well, it, we'll see that you could actually take this code and almost use it without modification in a streaming context, too. But right now, we're just, you know, we got these files, and we want to process them to build an index. So I want you to appreciate, even if the, the, you're totally confused by the Scala-isms here, just sort of the elegance of this thing. You know, I'm just, you know, step, 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 you know, just little functions inside each step that tell it what to do, like, you know, shuffle the tuple around or whatever. And it's extremely composable. These little operations are themselves very powerful, and yet I'm combining them to do some non-trivial work very concisely. And for me, this is what gets me excited. This is what gets me out of bed in the morning. Whereas in the days when I was writing with a crappy uh, MapReduce API, I would sort of have to drag my carcass out of bed every morning. So, so I'm a happy camper. And it reminds me of this. Anybody know what this is? The uh, Maxwell equations that I hear somebody say? <coughs> 
So I'm an old physicist. I'm a recovering physicist. I'm been, you know, been in recovery now for 30 years, I think. Um, anyway, but I remember when I first learned about these. You know, this is a DSL for electricity and magnetism. That's all you really need to know. But gosh, isn't that beautiful? And for me, when a code is beautiful, then I'm happy. And it tells me I can get stuff done and I'm not going to you know, be fighting bugs and fighting APIs. So anyway, that's a shout out to all you fellow physicists out there. Now, it, you, know, may, you might actually be able to read this from the back. I don't know. The font is maybe 12 point something. But anyway, it's a smaller program, but it's actually doing more work. And there's almost no ceremony. I got rid of the ceremony at the very beginning when I created a Spark context. And then I'm just you know, doing these transformations. You can tell I'm excited about this stuff. I really love this stuff. And it took me like 30 minutes to write that thing when I first wrote it. Now, of course, I knew the API already. so. It would take you maybe 40 minutes if you didn't know the API. But all right. Well, so uh, one of the reasons Spark is really pretty important, though, is not only is it really cool for writing code like we just saw, but it actually creates a really good foundation upon which we're able to build other tools and other APIs that express different kinds of, uh, let's call them paradigms, for lack of a better word, I guess. Uh, so I'll, I'll mention three of them quickly, and then we'll dive into a few. Uh, the first one is there's a really nice machine learning library. So Spark is much better if you have a, you know, an iterative algorithm, like you're training something with stochastic gradient descent or something, if you know what that is. Um, and th it's a small library at this point, but it's growing rapidly. I'm really excited that Cliff Click is integrating uh, H2O with uh, uh, Spark. Maybe you heard that if you t heard his talk earlier. I think it was today, because he, they've got a really great machine learning library. So that's going to be a pretty killer combination. If you have a graph problem, you might use Neo4j, but if, if, if your uh, algorithm won't fit in the size that Neo4j can handle, then GraphX is designed to be a distributed graph system. And Tachyon is uh, a little hard to explain right now, but um, it's basically taking Spark's intelligent ability to cache this uh, data and memory between stages and let that go in, into a separate process and be shared among applications. And they're actually describing this as an in-memory file system. So they're, kinda, you know, they're implementing file system semantics. I'm talking about this now. It's sort of alpha quality stuff, but I actually think this is going to be really disruptive when it's actually ready, because it's going to transform the way we write big data applications, in my opinion. You heard it here first. Let's put it that way. OK. Uh, one of the co really cool things is that you, with this nice programming uh, base, we can actually implement uh, structured query la language semantics on top. Now, this isn't going to be full database. We're not going to have transactions. We're not going to have inserts and updates. But it, we're going to put the queue back in SQL, where we're just going to focus on writing SQL queries to interrogate our data. And you can do some things like create new tables and whatnot, but it's not really designed to be a replacement for a relational database. But anyway, let's see how this works. So we're, we're going to basically get the best of both worlds. You know, sometimes a SQL query, have you ever hit this point where you're writing a SQL query and all of a sudden you slam into a wall because you can't quite express what you want to express with SQL? We've all been there, right? Well, now you can just sort of, all right, do your SQL where that works, but then flip back over to that Turing Complete API to fill in the gaps and just sort of mix and match. Also, if you have, uh, data in Hive. So Hive was the original SQL query tool in Hadoop. And a lot of people have data organized in Hive tables. It's really just files under the hood in HDFS. But if you have that kind of infrastructure, you can easily use Spark SQL with it. So that's, that's really useful. And they even have an ability for, uh, to work with JSON. So if you have documents, uh, records formatted as JSON, they can very uh, intelligently figure out the schema, uh, even write to JSON, and so forth. So that's a nice little feature that's kind of useful. So let's, uh, let's look at an example. So what I did for simplicity is I just took that crawl data that we were talking about as the output that would go into the inverted index. The reason I didn't use the inverted index data is it's, it was just a little too complicated to work with a variable number of things in the second column, because you know obviously the number of documents will vary depending on the word. And it was just a little too complicated for this talk. So some of the imports look the same, but now we've got some new things that like the, the word SQL in them uh, and schema RDD. 
Uh, this case class thing, this is a fancy way of just declaring like a record type. It's really just a regular class in Java-isms, but the, wor the keyword case adds a bunch of functions and things. But basically, we're going to say our crawl record is uh, a two-element thing. Uh, of the first element of type string, which is the document ID, and the second element is also type string. It's the contents. And then I'm adding this little, uh, once again, one of those singleton objects that with a parse method. This is just details for how I might parse just an arbitrary bit of text into one, one of those crawl record things for each line that I'm going to read in. So, you know, the details aren't that important, but just for completeness. And then I've added this do SQL method. This is just a helper method. The key thing is that the SQL method is something that comes with Spark SQL. I can, I'm going to pass in a string that's a SQL query, as you'll see in a minute. And then the rest of this bit is just say, all right, take the first 100 elements from the results set and print them out. That's all that's the rest of it's doing. So it's just a helper function. The interesting bit is that SQL function there that's near the bottom. All right, so I'll, uh, and now it's near the top. Uh, I'm going to, you know, crawl the data from some path. Uh, I'm going to create a Spark context like I did before. I didn't really talk about the arguments, but they're not that important right now. Uh, and then I have a little idiom for using a, basically a for loop to read each line of text, uh, call that parse method on it to return what will be one of those RDDs. So, so crawl, the type of crawl will be an RDD that's parameterized by that crawl record. So it'll be typed fields instead of just a bunch of strings or whatever. Uh, th there's some fancy stuff I'm doing here that handles like bad records. Um, you know, if you end up with a blank line or something that automatically just kind of throws it away. Um, but anyway, the details aren't that important. What's cool though is that once I've read in this data that has this schema, I can call this thing register as table, which is sort of a fiction really. It just basically creates sort of an in-memory set of metadata about it. I can't get at it from anywhere else. It's not going to persist once the job is done but it lets me write SQL queries against it. Uh, for any RDD, you can cache it in memory. If you know you're going to be going over and over, it's sort of a hint to the system, like this is important data, I'm going to keep reading it, so keep it in cache if you can. And there's a nice uh, little method to print the schema, just to the console. The interesting bit, though, is you know, look at that do SQL. Hopefully this looks very familiar. To, I'm assuming everybody here has probably written a SQL query at some point in your life. So notice that it knows that doc ID and contents are two fields that were in that crawl record class. I probably should have called that out earlier. And it knows that I, by that first register as table, I, I'm going to call my table crawl. So I'm just writing SQL. I could have written this with the regular RDD API, of course. But if you know SQL, you know, you can just bang these things out really fast. And in fact, it's really nice when you get to things like joins and group buys and stuff like that. Um, now the next bit is, uh, so the, the first output isn't all that interesting because it's just going to print like the document URL and then that long list of, uh, of text. What I did in the second uh, bit of fancy looking code is I just went ahead and created another table that's actually going to put the document ID in each word uh, repeated. So I'll, I'll have a lot of duplication of document IDs, one for each word. So that's all I'm doing in the second bit. It's a little fancy looking, but and I'm, I'm just reusing the crawl record, too. You can see that word has appeared again. Once again, I'll register this. Uh, I probably should have cached it because this is actually the one I'm querying over most. But now I'm just writing a bunch of queries. You know, or another one is uh, select star statement, select distinct, and look for the word management. You know, which documents have that word in it? And you can all do all this from a REPL, too. I don't have to write a program, compile it, you know, walk over to the IT guy and hand it to him on a, you know, a paper tape or whatever I used to have to do when I learned how to program. Um, no, I can just actually bring up a read eval print loop, an interactive console, and actually type these things in. Uh, and the last one I'm doing a group by. So, and, you know, actually I've, I actually left off, uh, cut off the slide at the end there, but um, the point is... I can mix and match the API that looks so nice. I can write SQL when that's what I know. Um, I can give the SQL console. There's actually even a custom SQL console where it looks just like any SQL console you've ever used. Give that to my data analysts if they want to play with this data and they don't have a clue what Scala is. And it just all works. All right, I also said that we need to have streaming support. So let's have a look at that. Let me see how I'm doing for time. So um, we'd like to be able to process events as they come in. 
And you may have uh, heard of tools like Storm and there's message queues and so forth that are specifically designed for handling like individual events as they arrive and doing some logic. The, the, the tact they took to kind of reuse all this infrastructure they already built is, well, what if we just uh, handle the case where it's okay to wait a few seconds or even a few minutes and just capture all the events that come in, you know, in certain time slices? And then put each of those time slices in one of these RDD things, and then I've got all this, the infrastructure that I can apply to it that we've just seen, including the SQL stuff. So that's the idea they came up with. So you wouldn't use this if you really do have to handle each event in some unique way or, or very quickly, but if, if all you're doing is like, you know, updating running averages or whatever, then this is perfect. So each of these slices uh, will be an RDD. They use the term slice or batch for those time slices. And they also give us some window functions. So if I want to do like a moving average over the last 10 windows or something, I can easily do that. In fact, that's what we'll see. So schematically, it looks like this. The events coming in from the left. It's called a D stream for discretized stream. The number of events in each time slice will vary depending on you know, the uh, bursts and traffic and whatnot. And I'm showing how I might have a moving window that I'm doing some calculations over. So that's sort of the extension I get on top of um, RDDs. All right, so now, now let's imagine that actually this crawl data is coming in live instead of it's been parked on the hard drive for six hours or whatever, and now I want to process it. So how might it look if I want to work with it live? Well, in fact, most of the code is pretty similar to what we already saw. Uh, there's some stuff at the top about, um, well, first, I created Spark Context as before, and then I wrap it in a streaming context, and that gives me these extra bits for streaming. But I can also wrap it in the SQL context I was using in the last example, so I can write SQL queries as well as use RDD functions. Uh, there's some logic you might put in about you know, a stream listener that would listen for the end of the stream or the stream you know, fails unexpectedly, that kind of stuff. Um, and then I have this little bit of flat map stuff where because I'm getting bytes coming in over a socket, is what I'm going to read. I'm just going to split each uh, you know, chunk of bytes on new lines, and that'll be my records. So that's all that's doing. Now the next bits are pretty much what we saw before. Uh, this for loop actually combines that stuff where I uh, initially uh, had the each line parsed, and then I later split it into words. I'm just doing it all in one step. So each of these yield crawl record things, that's going to be the uh, document ID and the word, document ID word, and so forth. And then I set up a window function. So every, uh, I didn't, oops, I kind of skipped past something important. Uh, one of the arguments that you give when you set up the streaming context is how wide you want these time slices to be. The, the smallest is about a second that's, that reasonably works. So you could do like millisecond resolution. But you know, 60 seconds or, or longer is fine. So I'm going to do every 60 seconds, and I'm going to do uh, when functions over the last five of those is what this is setting up. And then I use this special function for each RDD. Go ahead and make a table out of it, and then write this query, do this group by query that we saw on the previous slide with the line that I cut off. That's the last line that I left off on the previous slide. Uh, and here there's an explicit statement to start the stream processing and then wait for it to finish. So there's a little bit more setup before and after, but then in the middle, you've got basically all the same stuff that we've been using all along. Uh, so you get a, a lot of reuse that way. All right, so that's uh, my little, um, I don't know, propaganda maybe for Spark. Let's talk about SQL or SQL. So I was kind of a typical Java developer. You know, this is a confession, actually. Um, until, you know, like, say, four or five years ago when I started doing big data consulting. And I was like a lot of Java developers where I was kind of dismissive of databases. You know, I knew you had to have them, but uh, I, I really wanted to, you know, suck that stuff right into my object model in memory through the ORM and then just, you know, do the joins in memory or anything to, to avoid writing SQL. But what I really realized is just how powerful and concise and useful SQL is. Uh, when I was doing big data consulting, so I became sort of a late believer, I guess. But here's the interesting thing. So th the basic thing is, uh, you know, why did we actually say or start to think negatively of SQL, you know, besides dealing with DBAs or whatever? Um, you know, what was it that made us think that no SQL was important? And then how do we go back, or, or why would we go back? So let's talk about that just quickly. Why did we uh, actually invent no SQL in the first place? 
Well, the, the first reason was that you know, the early pioneers in the internet, uh, the, you know, the uh, Yahoo's and Amazon's and, and then later Google's, realized that they could not manage the amount of data they were getting with traditional uh, relational technology at the time. Yeah, uh, it, most of the SQL databases scale a lot better now than they did you know, in the mid-90s, but it just wasn't practical. You just couldn't even do it in most cases, uh, never mind what the cost was. So they needed some way to manage all this data but keep the cost to a reasonable size. And the other thing is we, we, it really became apparent that we needed to be more flexible about how we thought about things like consistency and availability. So the famous CAP theorem came about where, you know, if I like cut the cable between uh, Europe and North America, and let's say Amazon's catalog is only in North America, you know, am I just going to take Amazon offline in Europe because I can't be sure the catalog is up to date? Or is it better to just go ahead and show stale data? Maybe, you know, some people are going to buy something that's already sold out, but, you know, I'll just give them a gift certificate or something. But they can still do work. And once the cable is restored, then I can, you know, eventually get things consistent. So that was sort of the trade-off we realized that we needed to make. So a lot of the NoSQL databases give us that, that ability to either, in some cases, even tune whether we want consistency or availability in the face of partition tolerance. But, um, you know, the, the relational databases are hard over on the idea that you're not available if you can't be consistent. Consistency rules, whereas, you know, databases like key value stores, you know, even things like Cassandra and so forth, Often you'll want to just keep running even if you're inconsistent and then eventually bring the consistency back. So that was another thing we needed. And, it, you know, not all data is relational. Uh, many of you have probably used things like React where you're just storing massive, basically, key, it's basically a giant distributed hash map, you know, keys and some sort of values. Not everything has to be relational. People like Mongo because they like storing JSON documents and so forth. So that was another reason. But on the other hand, a lot of data actually does have structure. And it turns out, we kind of figured out pretty quickly that, yeah, the, the, the NoSQL databases are solving important problems and they're not going away. But there are times when we actually do have structured data and there's nothing like SQL to talk to that data. And um, if you go into a lot of companies where maybe there's you know, a few dozen developers and then you know, rooms of hundreds of data analysts, those, those folks are not going to write Java or even Scala but they are going to write SQL very easily because that's what they know. So it was actually Facebook that had this problem first, and they invented this tool Hive that I mentioned that gave you SQL query semantics on top of data that was just in a file system. So it sort of reversed another model, which was that the relational database could impose consistency when you wrote the data. It had total control over it. You, know, the f you had no idea how it was storing the data, what it was doing to it. Now we've flipped that so that maybe you know exactly where the data is, you know what the schema is, it may or may not actually always be a, you know, according to that schema. And these tools are gonna try their best to assume the schema is right, but you know, have pretty re uh, robust recovery when a record shows up that's completely bogus. So it gave us a new model. So we ended, actually ended up with two new approaches to SQL. And this is supposed to be sort of a frowny face, it's a lichen, anyway. Um, the first was kind of what I just showed with Spark SQL, where let's layer a query engine on top of uh, mostly HDFS, the distributed file system, but these things are also now talking to databases like HBase and Cassandra and so forth. So if you have a Hadoop cluster that looks roughly like this, where you've got some masters where you submit jobs, and they're also responsible for the file system. That's what that name node thing does. And all the data is in all these, in these disk farms, basically, that are managed by these other services. Then I could have these query engines that are maybe written in MapReduce, maybe written in Spark, or maybe something custom that's designed to be much more efficient than like a general purpose tool. And that's, in fact, what happened. Well, first, we're going to, whatever we use, we're going to submit jobs to this cluster, and it's going to figure out how to schedule things, and then you know, do this, these tasks over all the data. Yeah, the data's there, all right? Well, as I said a second ago, and I forget how many builds I have here, there we go. So Hive was the, the, like the prototypical thing. It was written in MapReduce. So Hive queries are always slow because MapReduce is slow, but they can work over petabytes of data if you're willing to wait. 
And actually, there's a new query. Uh, there's an alternative to Spark called Tez that probably won't really take off because Spark has all the, you know, the marketing attention, I guess. But they have replaced the MapReduce internals with Tez, and so it is actually, even Hive now is faster than it used to be, which is a good thing. But then Spark actually originally actually ported the Hive query engine on top of Spark, and they called that Shark because they're clever. Um, and that, that was actually really great for a while. You could just take your, uh, all the things you did with Hive, replace Shark as your query engine, and suddenly things were 30 to 100 times faster because of that in-memory caching I mentioned. But they uh, actually got tired of working with the Facebook uh, uh, data, or rather code, uh, that was inside Hive. So they've actually deprecated that. And this new C uh, Spark SQL thing I showed you is the new hotness as far as the Shark or Spark people are concerned. But then there's also been some custom query engines. Uh, the, 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 the current champion for performance is Cloudera's Impala, which is lightning fast. You basically create your tables with Hive, but then when you query them with Impala, you, know, you get uh, queries that come back you know, in milliseconds if for small data sets or seconds for really large ones. And there's some competitors that have emerged, Drill and Presto, just for completeness. There's even a few I left off. But, but anyway, the point being that um, this has been a very rich field for innovation of getting the best of both worlds. Data that's parked in HDFS or HBase or whatever, I can run SQL queries against it. I can run MapReduce or Spark jobs against the same data. It's a very rich way of doing things, lots of options. But there's also this sort of new SQL movement where a lot of experts and especially industry, or rather academic um, uh, luminaries like Stonebreaker and those kind of people have taken the lessons from what we learned about scaling NoSQL databases and brought it back to uh, relational models and distributed transactions and created this new buzzword, new SQL. And I'm just going to list these without going into detail, but it, um, it should have F1 next to Spanner. But Google now has this uh, incredible globally distributed database with global transactions. They've put atomic clocks in the data center so they can get as close as you can get to coordinating time across, uh, you know, the speed of light, time gaps, and crazy stuff like that. But there's some others here that uh, some of them are open source, most of them are commercial, that are trying to take us to the next level, but bring us back to the relational model when that's the right thing. So that's a pretty cool thing to watch. So to kind of wrap this up, what are some uh, conclusions, or rather, what are some things we might be able to speculate about looking forward you know, into the fog of the future, I guess? Um, I mentioned that you can run Spark on this new distributed computing platform called Mesos, and I actually think that that's going to grow in importance, that people who don't necessarily need Hadoop will actually start using Mesos because it gives them a lot more flexibility both to run Spark with other kinds of applications that have nothing to do with big data but run fine on Mesos, but even for some deployments in so-called big data scenarios, I think it'll be a gr of growing importance. Uh, and that further supports this. Uh, what's already really nice about Spark is we get a lot of flexibility about how we deploy uh, infrastructure. We can deploy Spark in a lot of different you know, cloud or uh, actual hardware environments. I think you should pay attention to Tachyon if you're interested in this space because I think that will be disruptive when it's finally uh, you know, production ready. Yeah, that's that thing that generalizes the cache to be something that a bunch of uh, applications could share data in memory, but sort of a, a file system model. Uh, I mentioned H H uh, uh, H2O. It's actually open source. It's a really wonderful compute engine for certain kinds of problems, really good machine learning libraries. And Cliff Click talked about it, I think, earlier today. So to recap, um, Spark is replacing MapReduce because we really needed to do it. Uh, it gives us the ability to do both the traditional batch mode processing and streaming. Uh, it integrates, a, it creates a foundation for building a bunch of other compute models like SQL, like graph theory, you know, like uh, machine learning libraries. But it also works really well in Hadoop. And it'll, you know, there's some rough edges that are getting fixed, but it's, it really is the future for writing jobs in Hadoop, in my opinion. And we're much better off for it. But also keep in mind that people are fixing SQL to make it more relevant for large data sets or distributed environments and so forth. So there's a lot of interesting innovation in this space as well.
But that doesn't mean that uh, NoSQL's gone away. I think we're just sort of, sort of really appreciating the strengths and weaknesses and reassessing, and the pendulum is kind of swinging back, which is always a good thing. And uh, I think we'll see Mesos grow in importance. I actually have um, some white papers on the Apache site, uh, sorry, the uh, TypeSafe site, and uh, I'm I'm doing a one-day workshop on Spark if you want to learn about it. Also, we have this thing called Activator. There's a Spark workshop you can do on your own time as well. So if you're interested in this, you can talk to me later. But uh, that's it. Thank you very much. <clears throat>